Hey guys, Casual Chrono here. It is early February 2024, and I'm about due to give you a rundown on my four super boss teams. I have an Alma team, a Sesta team, a Manalka team, and a Thunder team. So let's go ahead and start with my favorite team, which is the Alma team. The Alma team is made up of Alma, Shion Altar, Iffy, Radius. The back support is Mistrari and Ashtir. Alma is equipped with the best weapon in the game right now, the Elpis Bow, mainly for its overthrow effect. It also gives her critical all the time. For armor, she has a Dryad's Ring, which improves her critical strength, as well as giving her some uh, extra MP. And she has the weak point badge, which improves her damage by 30% when she hits a weak point. As far as Grasta, she has the Pain Grasta, and she has Bullseye, MP Consumption, and just an upgraded Power of Agony Bow for 35% pain instead of 30. She does also happen to have her uh, Valor Grasta. So that is Alma, skills wise. She uses Aether Alchema as her primary means of attack. It does inflict poison, so if I could stick Poison Grasta on her, but it's mostly because it pierces barriers. And Strength is based on her power. It's a magic attack based on power, so we have to keep that in mind when we're gearing. Her other two abilities are Elixir Ray, which allows her to use Lunatic a second time, and actually more than that. And then Brain Record, which allows her to change her attack to the target's weak point, and it stays like that. Xion Alter, or Jet Xion as he's known, he's basically more of a support character. Basically, he can produce Magic Stance. And remember that Alma's Aether Alchema is a magic damage uh, attack, even though it uses power. It also inflicts break, which allows Alma to do double damage. The other two skills that I've chosen for him are Suzaku Encirclement, which allows him to awaken his magic zone. And his first skill is Illusion Black Dragon. It improves the party's weak point damage, so it buffs Alma's when she's doing weak point damage. It also increases magic damage based on maximum MP value. And one of my sidekicks can actually improve Alma's MP even further. So he's basically there for support. So Grasta-wise, he has the power of pain times two for when he actually does do damage. But Xion is a cat lover, and so is Alma. So he has the almighty power cat lover Grasta equipped, which means passively he is giving Alma an extra 25% damage. Gear-wise... He has the Mujima Rod for when he does attack, Plasma Ring just for some extra MP regen, and the Flame Lord Badge, which reduces his MP consumption. It does boost his intellect a little bit, but that's not too important. The main thing is his skills. Ify is also support. Her presence alone improves party's damage and gives everyone basically a revive. So I want her built to be able to survive as well. She has a purity staff for some extra speed and status resistance, even though it's only like a, I think it's like a level two or three or something. It's maybe even just a level one. Oh, that's right. I boosted it to five. Okay. So it's a plus five purity staff. She has the Elpis ring, which improves her health. And she has the life spring badge, which gives her an extra 1000 health. It reduces her attack by 10%. But you'll see, she has no attack skills, so that doesn't bother me at all. She has Rosa Liliac, which puts pain and poison on everything and reduces their power and intellect and type resistance. So basically, as long as Rosa Liliac is up, it will always have pain, and every three turns I just need to reapply it, but I can reduce the incoming damage. She has Nocturnal Procession which improves the party's power by 50%, so by casting it, she improves Alma's power by 50%. And then her third skill, I have Herlania, which gives her a shield, and also status immunity for all party members. So she's completely support. 
Grasta-wise, I built her the same way. She has sound body for some extra health. Enhance at low HP for staff users, so she could conceivably make Jet Xion's damage a little bit higher. And she has 600 extra health here from this Grasta. So basically, I just boosted her health for survival purposes. And the sound body gives Xion an extra 300 health as well. So they're both there supporting Alma. Radius is a tank. And my radius has 120 light, which allows me to have two badges. So I have built radius to have a tremendous amount of health, and I'm going to tell you why. She has three, well, she has four skills thanks to her light, but she basically only, for me, she only uses two. Prominence Purge and Overwhelm. Prominence Purge inflicts rage, improves her physical resistance, gives her status immunity once, and when you're in any zone, so magic zone included, whenever she gets attacked, she heals the team and restores their mana. If she gets hit four times, she casts that four times. So it's a pretty awesome ability. She's basically a, a health and mana regenerator for the whole team. But her health comes into play with Overwhelm. She can, when she casts Overwhelm, it reduces enemies' power and it stacks, which is nice. It gives a barrier to all party members that reduce damage by 70% once, which is also nice. However, as long as I'm in Magic Zone, or any zone, and cast Overwhelm, Radius gains a shield based on her max health. Well, her max health is 12,850 right now, and that's pre-buffs, so she gains a 12,850 health HP shield. So she effectively has about 25,000 health once overpower goes off. And how do I get that high amount of health? She has three Grasta. Each one gives 300 HP. And each one has been upgraded from the Underworld's Light Shadow HP uh, based on light shadow points. Or each one of the, basically, if a character has over 50 light or over 50 shadow, this gives more than the HP plus ore. Tanks that have over 50 lighter shadow, this is usually better for them if you're trying to give them health. And then as I continue to raise her light points, then she, her hit points naturally go higher as well. So she also has MP consumption, 300 health and that ore, and she has just an HP restore, 300 health, and again that ore. Her weapon is the illusion speed, it improves health by 1,000. She has the Alpus Bangle, which improves her health based on her light points as well, and gives a very high amount of defense. And then for badges, she has two HP 2000 badges and 50% speed reduction badges. Those are found in Toto's Theater World. So all of that combined, the Grasta, the gear, etc., gives her this massive amount of health, and when she casts Overwhelm, then she gains a shield that has that exact same amount of health, effectively giving her 25,000 and some change hit points. So that is the main party. The back row support is all designed to beef up Alma. Mistrari is a bow user, so I can give her bow grasta. When Alma has max health, she gains 30% extra damage. If Alma's health is below 80%, she gains 40% extra damage. And if Alma is ever doing a crystal type attack, she gains 30% damage. Now, Alma is a crystal user. Her Aether Alchema is a crystal skill. However, if the weakness type, if I use Brain Record and the monster's uh, weak to fire, for example, that will change Alma's attacks to fire attacks. If that happens, the Crystal Grasta, this crystal type 30% power of bow, etc. That won't take effect if Alma is casting basically fire type attacks. But as long as she's doing crystal type attacks, her damage increases by 30%. The other back row character is Ashtir, or Luca, as I like to call her since I played Chrono Trigger quite a lot as a kid. And the reason I have Ashtir is because she has two Grasta Almighty Powers that both affect Alma. Alma is a gun user, and so is Ashtir. So by equipping the Almighty Power Gun Grasta, she ga Alma gains 25% extra damage there. 
Alma is also a glasses user, which uh, I don't see any glasses, but according to her personality, she is a glasses user. So the almighty power glasses works for her too. So Ashtir has almighty power glasses, which improves Alma's damage by 25%, and almighty power gun, that improves Alma's damage by 25%. And for the third Grasta, I really couldn't find anything, so I just gave her a proficiency debuff resistance by 15%, which basically gives the entire party an extra 15% chance to resist any type of debuff type skills. Sidekick wise, I have gone with Tetra and Guns. Tetra, mainly because when health drops below 80%, HP and MP go up by 25%, and the characters gain physical and magical resistance. Remember that Xion had an ability that improves damage based on maximum MP. Well, if Tetra's aura is in effect, then that skill is even more valuable. And then Gunts, primarily for the AF bar. If I use the AF bar once it's over and the AF bar is empty, or if a monster is able to drain the AF bar, all party member stats improve by 20%, which means Alma's power will also improve by 20%, thus affecting her damage. So that is my Alma team. And I have two, uh, I'm gonna fight a super boss. I'm gonna fight him two different ways to show you kind of how this team interacts with each other and how to use it. To give you an example of the Alma super boss team, I'm going to show you the mysterious Chaos Ogre hard mode. Uh, I do not have any built up resistant uh, defenses or anything like that, so this is pretty much just the Alma team. Mysterious Chaos Ogre Hard. According to the wiki, he's a level 10 super boss and he has barriers. He's also resistant to all sorts of things. Now I have a couple of options here at the beginning. You can see that he's resistant right now to Aether Alchema. I could cast Brain Record and make myself strong. I could cast Paper Tiger, which swaps the weak points. And I could do any number of other things. So I could Paper Tiger with Xion and Lunatic with Alma. I could blow the AF bar if it was, you know, to the point where I could. So, and that would activate Gunts' aura. There's a whole bunch of things I could do. Uh, for this particular fight, I am going to go ahead and Lunatic right away. And I'm going to Paper Tiger. I am going to put Pain and Poison. And I am going to Overwhelm. That will create a barrier for the entire team to reduce damage once and give Radius a 13,000 health ba barrier. Because the team is so low, Tetra's aura has kicked in, and I have even more of a maximum health. And my resistances are up a little bit more. You'll also notice that now Aether Alchema is strong against the boss. So I'm going to put down Break and a Magic Zone. I'm going to beef up my party's power, because remember, Alma needs power. I'm going to Overwhelm again and keep reducing the enemy's power. And we'll go ahead and cast one Aether Alchema and just see how much damage it does right now. One Aether Alchema pierced its barrier and brought all the way down to its HP stopper of 10%. I didn't quite catch the number. It looked like maybe 48 million or 480 million. I'll see in editing. But now I need to kill it before it kills me. Another Aether Alchemist should do it. I could awaken the zone. I could inflict break, all these things. It doesn't really matter. At this point, the fight is pretty much over. So that's an example of how the Alma team can manipulate 
weaknesses into strengths and pierce barriers and basically destroy things in two, three, four turns. So what I'm going to do now is fight the same enemy but use a different strategy so you can see a little more of this super boss team and how they interact. So this time, we're going to cast Brain Record, we're going to deploy Magic Stance, Pain, and Overwhelm. So this time Alma is the one that's determining whether or not she's strong against the boss. Tetrosa Aura, once again, is affecting the whole team, so they have a little more health and a little more resistance. Now on turn two, I could kind of do what I did before, but this time I'm going to blow the AF bar. I am going to cast Suzaku Encirclement, which will awaken the magic zone. I'm going to cast Nocturnal Procession, which will improve my party's power. And I'm going to work in one Prominence Purge, followed by an Overwhelm. For Alma, I don't want to attack quite yet, just so I can show off her skills. If I forget if I can Lunatic during AF. I haven't tried before. If I can, I will. If not, I'll probably just cast Elixir Ray over and over again. Suzaku, Nocturnal, Overwhelm, Bow Strike. Illusion. I guess we can lunatic during the AF bar. Since the AF, AF bar was drained, now Gunz's aura is also in effect. So if we click status and check Alma, she's lunatic. She has the extra resistances and max HP MP improvement from Tetra. She now has an extra 20% power thanks to Gunts. And we have an Awakened Zone. So now we are going to Paper Tiger. We are going to just do a Bow Strike because you'll notice that right now he resists her attacks. So we'll use Paper Tiger to manipulate that. We'll go ahead and let's go ahead and do Rosa Liliac again just to reapply that. And Radius is going to Prominence Purge this time. That means every time Radius is attacked, she should restore the team's mana and health. In this case, she was attacked three times, so she restored their mana and health three times. So Radius is a great way to keep your team fully healed and full of mana. And now we have a Lunatic, Aether Alchema about to come down on this guy. We're still in the Awakened Zone, so we'll do Attack Order to inflict Break. It's preemptive, so it will go first. And at this point, it doesn't really matter what the other two do. So what's going to happen in the Awakened Zone? Xion is going to cast Break, and Alma is going to do Aether Alchema. It's going to Barrier Pierce, so it does not matter that these 19 stacks of Barrier are there. And you should see a lot larger of a damage uh, than the previous attempt. There you go, it was 2 billion in damage. Take this. She actually hit the damage cap if you were watching. If you see the 214 number, that means damage cap. Now that was the last turn of the Awakened Magic Zone. 
We'll go ahead and put Magic Zone and Break up again and Aether Alchema. This will kill the boss. But uh, let's uh, Nocturnal Procession and Overwhelm again. Doesn't really matter. The boss is dead. And even without the Awakened Zone, we still hit the damage cap of 2.14, whatever it was. I think it's 2 to the 31st power minus 1 or 2 to the 30th power minus 1. I forget the calculation. But that is an example of how the Alma team works. You saw one where we quickly killed the boss, and you saw a second one where you got to see Radius's heals healing back up the team, and a little more manipulation of weaknesses thanks to Alma and Xion. My second super boss team is my Sesta team. Basically a wind super boss team. It's made up of Sesta, Melody or Suzette, Yiffa and Soira. The background characters are Azami and Tomei, and I'll go into that in a moment. This entire team revolves around Sesta, so she needs the most powerful gear. She has the Elpis Dagger, which is, has its overthrow, as well as always gives her crit. Technically, she doesn't need the crit, because Twin Blade Wolf always crits. She has Ring of Might, which improves damage when she's at max health. And she has the Vitality Badge, which improves damage at max health. As far as Grasta, she has the Pain Grastas. She has Bullseye on one, MP Consumption on one, and the third one is Windburned Pain, which you get from Azami's Astral Archive Tomes. It does pain and boost wind damage. For Melody, she's a defensive character. Her role is basically support. Her skills that I tend to use are Dark Drill, Depravity, and Magical Smash. Depravity is used because it puts pain on the enemy and it does not uh, it ignores target resistance. It also reduces the enemy's power and intellect and speed and gives a damage barrier to the team. And a lot of that uh, debuff uh, effects are increased when there's four wind allies in the front line and so forth and so on. Uh, if, and she's, if she's in demented state, all party damage is 100%. Damage against weak points is improved as well. So depravity is good for setting pain and survival purposes. Dark Drill reduces wind resistance by 50%, as well as some other things. And Magical Smash improves wind attacks by 20% and critical damage by 20%. So we know that Sesta always crits, so this improves her damage even further. Her gear. She has the Enduring Staff, which was an OOPA Arts drop. It gives her some regen and intellect. She has the Oriental Ring, which improves resistances. She has an HP 2000 badge, Speed Halved badge from Toto's Theater World. I don't care too much about her speed because uh, some of her skills, like Depravity, are preemptive, so they go first regardless. Her Grasta is also defensive natured. She has MP consumption reduction, and she has 900 hit points through her three Grasta. The other two Grasta are just, the effects are kind of pointless. Yiffa is all about spirit. You want to try and get as high of spirit as possible with Yiffa. So I have a spirit badge for her. For her gear, she has the Mujima Bangle, which as a longer fight goes on, her damage taken decreases, and the Miyaki's Hammer gives her some speed and reduces MP consumption. Her Grasta. She is immune to proficiency debuff resistances, so anything that tries to reduce her spirit can't, unless there's multiple you know, issues with that. It's technically possible, but it's very unlikely. And then she has two Grasta that just give her 600 extra health. They're not even awakened. But that puts her at just shy of 4,000 health. Her skills. I tend to use an Aurora, which improves type attack for three turns and speed, so she's improving Sesta's damage there. Binoct Buah, which is preemptive, improves strength, and improves power uh, to all weapon types. Uh, and then for any character that has faith, which is the uh, her special ability, it also improves their type attack. So this is uh, a party-wide buff. And then she has one defensive, which improves type and physical resistances and makes characters immune to knockback once. And then for anything that has uh, the 
faith ability, they gain a shield. So I tend to faith either Sesta or Soira. So if I faith Sesta, Sesta will gain a shield as well. And then we have Soira, who is dependent on critical rating and luck. Grasta-wise are basically just defensive. Each one gives her 600 health. And one of them is a regen. Gear-wise, since she needs crit rating, I give her a weapon that has a crit rating of 100%. I don't necessarily want to waste the Elpis Spear or any of the super high-end items, so I just gave her the Void Lance. And then she needs a lot of luck. The way her defense is calculated, basically, you take your luck, you divide it by 500, and then you multiply that by 0.75. And that means when you do the calculation with 350 luck, that ends up being 52 and a half. That means she passively reduces her damage by 52 and a half percent all the time. And that's all types of damage. How often does it happen? That's your crit rating, 100%. So 100% of the time, her damage is reduced basically by half. And it caps at 500 luck. So if I use Yiffa's faith to improve her luck, I could cap it out, and that means 100% of the time she would have a damage reduction of 75%. So that's the cap. So that so it's important for her to have luck and critical rating. So her armor has luck, the grace armlet. Her badges both have luck. and I've, uh, So I don't have a super high amount of hit points on her. I have some, enough to survive a couple of attacks, but you basically want crit and luck for her. Her skills. Floor Breeze is a wonderful skill. It reduces power and intellect and stacks. It also inflicts rage. So three attacks of it and you can max out your reductions on an enemy. And Floy Sincere improves her physical resistance and her type resistance for five turns. And when she's in a zone, she also gains a shield based on her max health. I have Elemental Guard and Self-Healing, but I pretty much never use them. It's just those two. So that's the front four. The back two, Azami, is a Grasta holder for Sesta. She has, if Sesta has max health, she improves Sesta's damage by 30%. If Sesta has taken damage and is below 80%, she improves Sesta's damage. And then if um, Sesta has max health, her damage goes up another 10%. So those all are designed to improve Sesta. Now technically the third one, if any wind character has max health, their damage improves by 10%, but the others aren't really damage dealers. And then Tomei, of all characters, happens to be an Avenger and a Katana user. Who knew? So Tomei has the almighty power Avenger. And Sesta is an Avenger as well. So Tomei is boosting Sesta's damage by 25%. And he's the one holding the power of Gale Katana. So he's boosting Sesta's damage by 30% because they're both Katana users. And then the third one, since he's a Katana user, I put on Sound Body. Sesta has an extra 300 health and 50 mana. So I was kind of surprised when I was searching for characters. I used a filter. I said Wind characters that have... Avenger, wherever Avenger went. I think, uh, did I pass it up already? Nope, there it is. And when I clicked OK, Sesta, Kikio, and Amy all fit that personality, along with Tomei, and Tomei, Tomei was a Katana user, just like Sesta. So I'm using Tomei. I actually have a use for one of those characters. So, as far as sidekicks go, I tend to use Tetra and Guns. Tetra besides restoring health after every turn, has an aura. If my team's, or if any character's HP drops below 80%, their max HP and MP go up, their physical and magical resistances go up, and basically they're much harder to kill. They, uh, Tetra also has a reincarnation skill, which is helpful if characters die. Guns has an aura that when I blow the AF gauge, all party members' stats improve by 20%. So that means Sesta's power improves by 20% if I blow the AF bar. 
or if some monster drains it naturally. So this is my Super Boss 2 team featuring Sesta. If I need to, let's turn off the filter now. I tend to use Melody when I have long drawn out fights, fights that will last more than about three or four turns. If I think the fight is going to go very quickly, I use summoning Suzette. The yes, I'm summoning forth the darkness. Suzette has her Dark Heavenly Tears uh, manifest. She has the Time Restored Bangle, which enhances her weak point damage and gives her a little bit of mana regen, though there are plenty of other things I could be using. And then she has the Crit Strike Badge. It improves uh, her crit by 30% and type attack by 10%. Suzette's skills, Dragon Assault does naturally crit. Bolt of Bahamut does not naturally crit. So Dragon Assault is fine, but if I choose to use Bolt of Bahamut, which is uh, a, one of her stellar awakening skills, I would like it to crit and do lots of damage. So I need to have some sort of crit buff or crit increase or something. So that's kind of the rationale behind that badge. I could just give a power badge and things like that as well. Besides these two skills, I tend to use Demonic Thrust. Demonic Thrust is preemptive, so it doesn't matter what her speed is. It reduces enemies' power and intellect by 40%, so it reduces incoming damage. And most important to me, it puts on poison and pain. It's persistent, so it won't go away, and it ignores target resistance. There are a few bosses that are able to clear their pain status, but I would just cast Demonic Thrust again and put it back on. It also inflicts Break, but that's not too important with Sesta because Break only affects the first attack, and it's Sesta's final two attacks that are really the big ones. So, so for short fights, this is my team, and for longer fights, I swap out Suzette for Melody AS. So let's see an example of both of those. So to show off the win team, I would like to fight the Warped Ancestor Gation hard. Just so you can see, I don't have any defenses upgraded or anything like that. So this is pretty much just my team versus the boss. So let's go ahead and summon him out. So on turn one, I could blow the AF bar. I can spam Dragon Assault. I can hit Benat Buwa and then cast Anor War, or if I want to upgrade defenses, Ath Dacus. And I'm going to work in one Foy Sincere, and then the rest will be Floor Breezes to reduce the enemy's power. So I'm going to hit Starving Wolf a few times first before I switch over to Twin Blade. So we're gonna do two, three, two, two, and then just spam oops, their first skills. So two, three, two, two, Twin Blade Wolf, spamming first skills. And I've hit the first HP stopper. Now Gunsa's aura and Tetra's aura are both in effect right now. I'm going to do one more Floor Breeze to max out those stacks. Now I can hit Faith, and I'm going to Faith Sesta. And... We're going to just Dragon Assault because nothing else to do. Sesta is going to Twin Blade Wolf because that's what she does. So there's the third stack of Floor Breeze. We've hit the second HP stopper. And now Sesta has Faith, which means all of her stats are increased by a lot.
I could blow the AF bar again and pretty much ensure the victory. So we're gonna cast Benoct Buwa to improve team's damage. Twin Blade Wolf. We're going to uh, we'll noblesse oblige, redirect everything to Soira just in case. But let's see what happens. And she didn't even have to do her final attack. The boss is dead. So that's an example of how this team can knock out pretty tough bosses. That was actually my first time beating him, too. To use an example with Melody AS, we're going to fight this boss. Warped SD-148. He tries to deploy an Earth Zone, but my team gets the Awakened Wind Zone. Sesta's going to Twin Blade Wolf like she always does. You'll notice this boss has 50 stacks of a shield. Her final two attacks will go through that shield. In this case, Melody is going to be the source of pain and poison. So we're going to, well, pain. So we're going to inflict depravity on the boss. We're going to Faith Sesta right away. And we're going to voice and seer. There's Faith. There's Twin Blade. Here's the final two swings. And you'll see the boss went down to about 40%. Now in this case, the boss has an MP drain. Melody's end of turn skill is a heal and restores magic points. So even though Sawyer lost a lot of her mana, she got some back. So we're going to Twin Blade again. We're going to... Actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and blow the AF bar and beef up their stats even more. So we're going to Starving Wolf a few times. We're going to Magical Smash once and then Dark Drill. She'll Binoct Bua and then An... And then, uh... Actually, we'll Ath Noakus first, then Binoct. This boss has a knockback. And she's going to spam Floor Breeze at this point. So we're going to go one, three, three, one, and then just spam one. And when the AF bar reaches around there, I'm going to switch over to Twin Blade Wolf. So one, three, three, one, spam one a few times. This is also a great way to get rid of that shield. All right, Twin Blade. We hit an HP stopper. He restored his health, deployed an Earth Zone. Tetra will heal up. And Melody's end of turn healed up as well. Now, we have an Earth Zone in play right now, so as long as these four characters can stay in the front row, Melody should recast her Wind Zone. So we are going to... Uh, let's Elemental Guard this turn. Path Dacus. We're going to... Uh, let's see, let's, it's been a little while since we depravity Let's depravity again, keep that boss's int and power down. And you'll notice that Sesta cannot cast Twin Blade Wolf because she doesn't have a stack of Divine Wolf. So we're just going to cast Starving Wolf. The barrier has been restacked to 50 and with a few hits in, Tetras, it's down to 47. However, thanks to the team's defenses and Tetra's 30% buff, you can see that the team did not take much damage at all. So we're going to do the exact same thing again. We'll do Magical Smash this time. Uh, we're going to Anna Roar. And let's go ahead and Floor Breeze it. Testify. How's this? 
Now the boss's first knockback did not work, but the second one did, because there's only one stack of knockback protection. So Sawyer is going to move into the front line. We're going to restore knockback, dark drill, and starving wolf again. Sawyer is back. Sawyer is not taking much damage despite being in an earth zone. And we'll cast Depravity again. We'll Athdokus again because it was cast while Sawyer was, was out. And we'll do Foy Sincere. And Soira is now out of mana. But what's this? We have an Awakened Wind Zone again. And that is due to Melody. So now we can Twin Blade Wolf. So I think it's about time to end this. So we have all the debuffs on there. We're going to Dark Drill. We're going to Binoct Buwa and Twin Blade Wolf. Remember that the final two hits will go through the barrier. And the boss is now dead. So for longer fights that can't be finished in two or maybe three turns, I find Melody is a little bit better than Suzette because we can have an instant restoration of Awakened Wind Zone. My Manalka team is my third super boss team. It focuses, of course, on Manalka, who can also barrier pierce. And this is how I have this team set up. Manalka, being the main damage dealer, has the best weapon, the Elpis Sword. For armor, she has the Dryad's Bangle. The Elpis Bangle would be a very good weapon for her as well. However, I happen to be using it on the tank. But the Dryad's Bangle improves critical strength, so that's always nice. And then she has a Power Plus Speed Halved Badge and that's from Toto's Theater World. That I like having her speed low because that gives the rest of her team time to cast their buffs and debuffs before she goes. Grasta-wise, she has Pain Grasta, one with Bullseye, one with MP Consumption, and one that also improves Fire-type attacks. And the skills that I pretty much use, um, there's really only one skill I use, is, and that's Rip and Tear. It's a it attacks three times, it barrier pierces, it inflicts elemental break fire, and it inflicts pain. And it, it gets stronger the more tributum you have. If the enemy has 50% health or more, that, then Manalka goes again. Tributum, by the way, is gotten by, uh, every, at the beginning of every turn, Manalka causes damage to her team. The more damage she causes, the more stacks of tributum she gets. So it's actually to your advantage if you use Manalka to have a team where the rest of the team's health is very high. It'd be nice to get Manalka's health high too, but I tend to use the Grasta more for DPS. So for my fire setter, I use Sukiya Altar. If you don't have her, Aisha, a free character, can do almost everything that Sukiya Altar can except awaken the zone. So Aisha, I used for a very long time. Since Sukiya's main goal is to set zones, buff, and basically survive, that's how I have her built. Let's look at her skills first. She has Shekhar and Rambu, which reduces fire resistance, improves fire type attacks, and when fire zone is there, uh, she can awaken the zone. And Surging Blaze improves the team's power. Uh, and other things by 35%. If I cast morale on someone, uh, such as Manalka, it would also improve her weapon damage. And then Bakarin Lament is the skill that deploys fire stance in the first place. As far as Grasta, I have MP Consumption, HP Restore, and MP Restore. Each of those has 300 health. 
and then each one has been upgraded with 300 more health. So she gets 1800 health from Grasta alone. So Sukiya Altar has 6000. Iffy has 5500, basically from the same type of thing. She has, has Sound Body Staff, Enhance at Low HP Staff, and HP Restore, which has 600 health. So I could. If I didn't have Iffy in my Alma team, I could beef her up with even more health if I wanted to. She has the Purity Staff, which improves some speed and status resistances. She has the Elpis Ring, which improves her health. And she has the Life Spring Badge, which gives her 1000 health and takes away 10% of her attack. However, she has no attack skills, so that doesn't matter. The skills she does have are Rosa Liliac, which is Pain and Poison Setter and reduces power and intellect. She has Nocturnal Procession, which improves the party's power and helps with a knockback and effect. And Herlania, which restores statuses of all party members at, pretty much at the end um, and gives status immunity, gives her a shield, and so forth. So she is defensively minded as well. She's the same one as in my Alma team. And Radius is also the same one in my Alma team, geared the same way for HP. She has 13,000 unbuffed health. She has more health here than she does in the Alma team, and that is largely because of Aldo. If you need to see Radius's, an explanation of Radius's health and her Grasta, you can check out the Alma portion. But Aldo is one of the two in the back row that holds Grasta. And he has Robust Body Sword, which improves all sword members' health by 300. Enhance at low HP, so when Manalka does her beginning of turn damage, everyone has 80% health, therefore Manalka's damage goes up by 40%. And he has Power of Inferno Sword, all sword users, their fire type attacks go up by 30%. And that means he is buffing Radius and Manalka as well as himself. So that's why Radius has more health. She's gaining an extra health from the robust body Grasta that Aldo is holding. Violet is also a sword user. She has Almighty Power Glutton, and Manalka is a glutton, so she is boosting Manalka's damage by 25%. Every so often, during the fight, for some reason, Manalka can get healed. If she happens to be at max health, her damage will increase. That almost never happens, but I have the Grasta just in case. And then I didn't really have a good third Grasta to give. Uh, I could have given like a regen or something like that, but instead I just went ahead and gave a proficiency debuff. All party members have an extra 15% chance of resisting whatever debuffs are thrown their way. As far as sidekicks, Manalka's sidekick, Tetra, is a great character. So she takes 20% of health, and at the end of the turn, he restores health. And in fact, he also boosts maximum health and mana and resistances whenever characters hit 80% or below. So pretty much right after turn one, his aura kicks in, and all the characters' max health improves. So everyone gets more, which means Manalka gets more tributum. Kurobo is the character that I use for my second uh, my second sidekick, and that's because when someone takes fire type damage, his aura kicks in, and the enemy's power and intellect permanently goes down by 25%, and it can't be prevented. Now that does affect my party. So if I'm fighting uh, an enemy that does fire damage to me, my team's or my character's power and intellect can go down as well. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. If I think I'm going to use the AF bar instead, I might swap out and have guns. But since this is a fire team, Kurobo's aura is pretty much always guaranteed to work on whatever super boss I'm fighting. So to show off the Manalka team, I've chosen the Fairy Raccoon Dog and Yasuzume. So with this fight, the enemies are weak well, some of the enemies are weak to fire. So we are going to go ahead and set up a fire zone. We are going to cast Pain Poison. We are going to Overwhelm. And Manalka is going to Rip and Tear, because that's pretty much the only skill you'll ever use with her. Fire zone, Pain Poison, Rip and Tear. She's already knocked out both of those bosses. And then the raccoon is going to pop up. Ow! 
The team took damage, and you'll notice that she now has 48 stacks of Tributum. So we're going to rip and tear again. We're going to Surging Blaze, which will improve team's power by 35% and critical damage by 30%. We're going to Nocturnal Procession, which improves the power by 50%. And she's going to Overwhelm, though she never actually got to last turn. The boss is over 50% health, so she goes twice. Boss is dead. And if you were collecting Void weapons, you would now have the Void Fists. So that's a quick fight using Minalka. Now I'm going to show you the Karakuri Heart of Ro, another super boss, happens to be weak to fire. And this one is probably going to take a little more time, so you'll get to see a little bit more of the dynamics of the team. So we're going to start deploying Fire Zone. Analka is going to... Let's see... Let's do Annihilator to improve her health. We're going to Rosa Liliac, and we're going to Overwhelm. We're going to Surge in Blaze and Nocturnal Procession now to beef up Manalka, who will continue to rip and tear. We're going to go ahead and Prominence Purge, so that way we can start getting some mana regen and heals. And there would be an example of the heal and mana regen. Manalka has 50 stacks of Tributum, so we're going to rip and tear. We're going to awaken the fire zone. We're going to Rosa Liliac again since he cleared his debuffs, and we're going to overwhelm. And you'll notice that now we've hit the first HP stopper. The boss has cleared his debuffs again, so let's check and make sure that we still have some of our own buffs. Yep, looks like two turns at least for most everything, so we can Rosa Liliac, we can go ahead, cast Rip and Tear, Shakur and Rambo, and we will Overwhelm. Next turn, we're going to rip and tear. We're going to shab Curran Ram. We're going to surging blaze this time, and we're going to nocturnal procession this time, and overwhelm this time. And you just saw that radius took a ten thousand point hit and it didn't even eat into her health. So now we're going to blow the AF bar. We're going to rip and tear. 
She can Shakur and Rambo. She can cast whatever she wants. It's not really going to matter. And we'll have her prominence purge. Chivalry doesn't really matter as well. You see, the boss is already dead. That's an example of a slightly longer fight and shows the dynamics of the team against a pretty hard boss. My fourth super boss team is my Thunder team. When I looked at the characters that I had access to, I saw a few common themes. The Another Force combo rate went up with several of their abilities, and because I have Gunts as a sidekick, who's designed to beef up the team when the AF gauge is empty, it really kind of shouted to me that this was a team that was should be designed to blow the AF bar on turn number one and kill as much as possible. So basically it's a one turn AF kill type of team. To do that, Obero is the primary damage dealer. I do have a tank, Villette, I'm using as support, and Miyu is another damage dealer. So we'll start with... Actually, let's start with Obero. Since Obero is the main damage dealer, he should have the best weapons. So I steal the Elpis Dagger from Sesta whenever I want to use this team. The Pain Grasta are still the best Grasta to use, so I have Power of Pain with Bullseye. I have a Power of Pain, it's not upgraded yet, and I have Power of Pain damage improved when Zone is awakened. And that's because the way this team is set up, you start off right off the bat with an awakened Thunder Zone. As far as gear, he has the Elpis Dagger, he has the Glimmer Ring, which improves critical strength. Remember the Elpis Dagger gives him 100% critical rating, so he will always crit. I've improved his speed as well with the Glimmer Ring. Since we're using the AF bar, I want their speed to be kind of high so they get as many turns as possible. As far as badges, I'm using the Sword Savior badge, which gives him power, and then the MP Consumption effect, which is why I don't have MP Consumption on his Grasta. I, they don't stack as far as I'm aware. Since he's Stellar Awakened, he has access to Rising Beat, which, which basically just activates his Itu Ryu Haze effect. And it does it at extra, extra large strength. When sparks stack up to 50 plus, he can consume them and increase uh, his damage even more. His Stellar Burst also allows me to have a Barrier Pierce uh, attack three times. Otherwise, the other two skills that I've chosen for him in slot number two I have his power increases, and slot number three, I do have increase uh, weak point damage for enemies that are weak to thunder. But for the most part, I'm going to use his second skill first, and then just spam Rising Beat. So if he has Pain Grasta, I need someone to set Pain, and Miu ES has a skill that does that. Her Levin Longitus, Longitus, Long Longitus. Again, pronunciations not my strong point. It inflicts pain and ignores target resistance. So as long as I cast it, the enemies will have pain, and it affects all enemies, which is nice. So it is also my slot two skill. So when I blow the AF bar, I am going to spam all my level two or number two skills first and then I'm going to spam the number one skills. You'll see that in a moment. So I'm going to inflict pain with it and then her first skill. It's a thunder type piercing attack on all enemies. The strength increases when the enemies have status effects and it also increases another force combo rate. 
So that's the reason I chose it to be my spamming. I want to increase the combo rate as much as possible. And then I do have a third attack, a thunder type piercing attack on a single enemy and it increases damage based on speed so I want her to be fast as well and it also can increase based on my combo rate. So again, combo rate is a common theme with this Thunder team. As far as gear, she has the Elpis Spear, pretty much the best spear at the moment right now. Armor, she has Guidance Bracelet for an extra attack boost. And the badge I've opted for is the Power Plus 30 and MP Consumption, because her skills do consume a lot of mana. And you can actually see the MP consumption at work. If I remove it, the cost of her skills go up. You can see Levin Longitus is 79. If I equip the Dragon Badge, now that skill is 71. Again, since I'm blowing the AF bar and hopefully killing everything on the first turn, it really doesn't matter because it doesn't consume uh, mana. But it's there. I mean, I still get 30 power. So so those are the two main damage dealers. Valette, from what I understand, can do a lot of damage as well. But I've kind of built her more as support for this team. Uh, I'm still kind of figuring out overall how Thunder works together. So anyway, as far as her skills, when I looked at things, she has a Thunder-type magic attack that hits four times and it improves the critical rate. When amped is 50 uh, plus, it improves uh, or it reduces thunder resistance. So I figured that would be a good one, uh, and it stacks. So that'd be a good one to spam in an AF bar. A stacking thunder resistance seemed like a good idea. For her second skill, I want something that improves the whole party as well, and she has Exosia, which improves the party's power and thunder type attack and some other things. When she's in Thunder Stance, the buff effect increases uh, by two. So, and then it does improve magic damage, but none of my team has magic, so. So again, first turn, I can uh, click that skill and my team's power and Thunder type attacks will all increase. And then I do have uh, Deploy Thunder Stance as her third skill for longer fights. That way, if the Awakened Zone runs out, I can deploy it again, though I think Guns can do that too. So this might be kind of repetitive, but it does provide me with an MP regen uh, and so forth, that it can awaken the zone, etc. So since she's more support-oriented, I built her more support-oriented. She still has the Elpis Hammer, because she still can do a decent amount of damage. However, her armor improves her resistance, and her badge improves combo rate. Again, it seems like that the Thunder team is designed for improving their combo rates, so I gave her a badge that will help with that. Grasta-wise, she has MP Consumption Hammer, but it's more for her 600 health. Another 600 health. And then just because she can do some damage, I threw in an Enhance if max HP. She does an extra 30% damage uh, with her attacks. It is shareable, but none of the other characters are hammer users, so that one's really just for her. I could have given her another 600 health, and she would have been over 5,000. So, again though, this team is designed to try and kill something on the first turn, so I wanted to give her something that would give her extra damage. I could have given her Pain Grastas as well, so that's an option if you don't have those particular Grasta. And then finally, I have a tank for the Thunder team, Orlea AS. Her skills. She has Foodry Hatch, which also improves another force combo rate. So that's why I have that as the spammable first skill. For her second skill, I wanted to find something that would improve the team, and she has Allumage, which improves the team's power and speed. And in Thundering Stance, the buff effect is improved, and damage of all party members with any weapon types is also improved. So I figured that would be a good skill to spam uh, at the very beginning of the AF combo bar. And then she is a tank, so the best two tank skills for her are Defense Teutonere and Resistance. It's a prayer and it reduces the enemy's power and turns the enemy's uh, attacks into Thunder types when you combine basically both of these. 
So there it says, change all enemies attack type to thunder. And then her, uh, and then she gains basically a damage barrier against thunder attacks and reduces their power. So in a longer, more drawn out fight, I would probably be using these two instead of all you mage. But again, designs to kill for one turn. She has the Mujima X. Elpis X probably would actually be a little bit better, uh, but just she's a tank. Uh, since she's a tank, she has the Oriental, Oriental Necklace, and she has a badge that improves her health. Her Grasta also are designed to improve health and give her a regen. So she has 600 health from this, 600 health and a little bit of MP consumption from this, and 600 health from the self-healing Grasta. So she has over 7,000 health if I do need to actually tank something. So those are the main four. Since Obero is the main damage dealer, the support in the back is designed to help him. Sukiya has Power of Thunder Katana, so Obero's damage goes up 30% no matter what. She has the Almighty Power Eastern, so Obero is an Eastern uh, character, so his damage goes up. I haven't awakened it yet, but Obero is actually a mask user as well. And so whenever I bother to actually upgrade this and make it shareable, Obero's damage would also go up 25%. Victor is holding Enhance if Max HP Thunder from the uh, Entrana, another dungeon. It improves uh, damage by another 10%. And then when I want to use him, I will swipe the Enhance Low and Enhance Max HP Katanas from Azami and have those equipped for the fight as well, partic particularly uh, focused on the, the Max HP. Because when the fight starts, everyone's at full health, and I'm going to be blowing the AF bar so everyone's health should stay high during the fight. So that is the team, and those are the back row choices, boosting Obero's damage. Sidekick-wise, Guntz is the best sidekick for a Thunder team. When you drain the AF gauge, the entire team's stats will improve by 20%. So if something survives the initial AF bar, at least everyone has an extra 20% stats. In addition, since he's in the front row, he can inflict Elemental Break Thunder, and he can improve the party's type resistance, buff effect can be increased by his stats, in his charge skill, he does 10 thunder attacks. He grants lunatic to everyone on the front row. And since Follette is in the front row, he also inflicts thunder elemental break 10 stacks on all enemies, and he can deploy awakened thundering stance. So basically, once the awakened thunder zone ends, once he can uh, cast this spell, I can redeploy an awakened thundering zone over and over and over again. Again, since this team is designed to kill things on the first turn, that probably won't happen, but that is one way to continuously have Awakened Thunder Zone. The other sidekick is Tetra, and that's mainly because if people die, I can always swap him out and cast Reincarnation. Or the other thing, when my team's hit points drop below 80, uh, any one character, doesn't have to be the whole team, they will, his aura will kick in, they will gain physical and magical resistance, and gain an HP and MP buff that's continuous for the rest of the fight. So that is my Thunder Team. As I said, I'm still kind of learning the finer points of the Thunder Team. I'm not sure if this is the best way particularly to use Valette, but the team does seem to work. And I'm going to give you an example of that now with the Yukwashi Clan. Now the only thing we need to double check is see if anything is null to thunder. And it does not look like anyone is it null to thunder. Nope. Looks like we have one resist, but that's it. And that's perfectly workable. So the way this thunder team is set up, the second ability for all four characters is what I hit first, and then I just spam the first ability. I tried to set it up so that's nice and easy. So Miyu goes first, so she's going to inflict pain. Then I'm going to boost the power, uh, party's power. I'm going to boost Obero's power. And I'm going to boost the party's power. So I'm going to blow the AF bar, 
set pain and boost the team. Following that, basically I just spam piercing attacks on all enemies and you'll notice that it says when in thunder stance increase another force combo rate as long as the enemy has status effects. Well it has status effects because we inflicted pain. Valette is going to basically spam her thunder type magic attack and that she's going to keep the party's critical rate at 100%. And when Amped is above 50, she's going to start doing more damage and reduce Thunder type resistance. Obero is going to spam Rising Beat, which basically is just going to spam his most powerful attack. It does give Barrier Pierce in a Stellar Burst. I might work in a Stellar Burst just to show that. And then the tank has one attack her foundry hush and it will also improve the another force combo rate so we are going to target that one first spam skill two then spam skill one two 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 and now just spam one over and over again The first Yukwaji's dead, the second Yukwaji's dead, and the third Yukwaji is dead. And just to show off the Stellar Burst, Rising Beat, this is how it's done. It pauses the combo bar. We're already at 99 stacks here, so we'll go ahead and burst, and then just resume spamming. You can see the massive amount of damage it's doing. You'll notice the combo bar is at in the 800s now. Let's see how high we can get it. 900s. Oh, I got to 1200 in a previous attempt. But anyway, that is the Thunder Team. It's designed to do a one turn AF. And that's pretty much how it functions. Finally, and very briefly, I'm going to go over my leveling team. My leveling team is the team that I use when I want to burn red keys and I'm working, you know, hoping to get treatises, codexes, opuses, whatever to drop. In order for me to maximize my rewards, I need to make sure that my light points are over 120 or my shadow points are over 120, depending on the dungeon. And so I have three characters that are pretty much mainstays. Suzette, Subami, and Flamopolis. Their light points combine to 114. So as long as one of my remaining three characters basically has six points of light or more, I'm guaranteed to always have maximum rewards. Secondly, Suzette is Stellar Awakened, and that means at the start of the battle, before I ever cast anything, Pain and Poison are on all of the enemies. So I don't even need to take a turn casting Pain and Poison. Subami and Flamopolis have auto attacks that attack all enemies. So I have Pain and Poison Grasta on them. So Subami has Power of Pains, Wana has Bullseye. And Flamopolis has power of pains as well. One of them with bullseye. So basically, I walk into a fight, I hit auto attack, and Subami or Flamopolis will always go first because they're preemptive, and they usually, just by themselves, kill all the enemies. So the three of them are doing the heavy lifting, which gives me three slots to use for my leveling. So right now, I got Bertrand recently, so I'm leveling him up. He has the XP 50% badge. Aldo and Suzette both need a ton of experience. Uh, so both of them actually have the experience badges as well. And then I finished Riz's second saga, or second chapter recently. Second part, I guess. It was three chapters. So she is slowly working her way up to 80, and she has the experience badge as well. Psychic-wise, I got Erudian. So he is in the group getting experience as well, working his way towards level 60. So pretty much I have three characters that will destroy any red key dungeon 
and then three characters that I can level up. And one of them, like I'm doing Aldo right now, so I'm running Migland's Castle, and that's allowing me to also get his light points up, since there's a random chance of that happening. If I ran Industrial Ruins, I'd have Amy there, and so forth. So whoever, if I go to a dungeon that gives uh, a potential for a light or a shadow point, I make sure they're one of the three characters uh, that is in the leveling group. So if I need a shadow team, I can just swap out and I can sort by shadow. Pry by himself, because I pull him all the time, has 120 shadow points. Nero has 118. So I could stick one of them in the back row and already have all three rewards covered pretty much. So that is my leveling team gear wise. Yes, they have the Elpis weapons. Do they need it? Not really. The gear is just anything that helps to improve their attack. So, so that is my final uh, team. I have a leveling team. I have my Alma team, my Sesta team, my Minalka team, and my Thunder team, or Obero team, since the first three were named after the main DPS, and I keep calling this one Thunder. So anyway... That's what I have to work with right now, uh, February 2024, and hopefully maybe this gave you some ideas on how to set up your characters. Uh, fairly straightforward. My first character is a barrier piercer. My second character is, and third characters are usually support, and my fourth character is usually a tank type. And I usually have someone that can set the zone if the zone isn't set automatically. So there you go. Anyway, I hope this helps. Casual Chrono, signing out.